So we just went through the most horrific attack a person could go through. And then he puts us through more hell, telling us to shut up. So Israel can get by with cold-blooded, premeditated murder, along with the help of our government that sent us there to be set up to be sunk by Israel and blame it on Nasser. This was an emotional field tourney referring to an event that has not only shaped his life, but that virtually reverberates in the highest echelons of power to this very day. What you will hear in the following interview is a complex and multifaceted story, so much so that I thought I'd help you on your way with some pointers. So bear with me for a moment, it's really worth it. And you will understand why this case is still relevant today, maybe even more so than ever. Now, we are in early June 1967. The Six-Day War in the Middle East between Israel, Egypt, Jordan and Syria is in full swing. In comes a lightly armed but very sophisticated US spy ship, a ship with the evocative name USS Liberty. This ship, with about 300 sailors on board, is patrolling in international waters off the coast of Egypt when, on June 8th, Israeli fighter jets, helicopters and torpedo boats launched a vicious and unprovoked attack, an attack that lasted longer than the attack on Pearl Harbor and which resulted in two-thirds of the crew either being killed or wounded. And that's only the surface layer of the story. What's hidden underneath is material worthy for a thriller and we will have to peel back quite a couple of layers before we can even get a glimpse of what really was going on. Israel and the US government have always claimed that this was a case of mistaken identity, that Israel attacked the USS Liberty because they thought it belonged to Egypt. The problem with this argument is that today we know that Israel recorded the transmissions between ground control and the attacking pilots during the attack. So we know that Israel not only knew from the very beginning that the ship they attacked was an American ship, but also that it was a pre-planned and deliberate attempt to sink the US target. Al Jazeera has published the original tapes a while back and I've left a link to it in the description. But the darkest part of this story is yet to come and it highlights why all of this is so relevant today. It also explains why it was so important to sink the USS Liberty. As I'm recording this, images of Israel's attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria yesterday are all over social media. The attack on the actual embassy is, according to my initial analysis, an attempt to provoke Iran and to finally draw the US into a war with it, a long stated goal not only of Netanyahu, but of consecutive Israeli administrations. So what's the connection here with the USS Liberty attack? Two words. Operation Cyanide. And British journalist and author who has worked for the Sunday Times, Daily Mirror, the London Evening Standard and the BBC Television amongst others even wrote a whole book about Operation Cyanide. This book may shock readers interested in Middle Eastern affairs as it shows that the US was prepared to sacrifice 300 men, that it even risked a nuclear war with Russia to ensure victory for Israel and how it then tried to cover everything up. In a sense, the USS Liberty may have been the sacrificial lamb to be slaughtered to justify an attack on Egypt, which at the time was armed and supported by its ally Russia. As Noam Chomsky told me in an interview, the Israelis may blow up the world, but who cares? They have God on their side. And now before we jump into the interview with Phil, a quick call to action. Some of the best interviews on this channel are shadow banned, which means YouTube is not presenting them to you, the viewer. Some examples are Noam Chomsky's interview about Israel, the interview with the Swiss historian Dr. Daniel Eleganza, or the amazingly candid discussion with the US ambassador Charles Freeman. So if you're interested in content that apparently you're not supposed to see, content that goes against the mainstream narrative, have a look at some of the previous interviews that we have recorded for your pleasure. And of course, it really helps to spread the news if you like and subscribe to this channel. Phil, Phil Turney, Turney, right? Phil Turney. Yes, Turney, T-O-U-R-N-E-Y. Perfect. And you can be found on the internet on the, under that name, US Liberty Phil Turney. Uh, yeah, just uh, Google Phil Turney. I'm all over the internet. Okay.
Now, very nice having you, Phil. You just told me it's snowing uh, where you are on the other side of the world. How is it going? It's it's going very well. I mean, uh, it's it's spring here. This is a spring storm, but uh, thanks for inviting me on on this important subject of, of the attack on the USS Liberty by the Zionist State of Israel and how it all came about. Yeah, and you, you just said something. It is really important and is relevant for many reasons till today or even today or even the whole period between then and today. Yeah, It's now 57 years ago. So for people we don't, who don't know, so you are a survivor of the Israeli attack on the uh, U.S. intelligence ship. I don't know if that's the correct name because it wasn't really a warship, USS Liberty, on the 8th of June in 1967, right? That's correct. This is what we are here to discuss. I watched a lot of interviews that you uh, have given, you and your colleagues. Uh, I, I read uh, a number of uh, things and I took out let's say four points uh, but again this interview is free this these are just some some general points we can we can discuss the attack itself yeah and to make it clear that it was an attack that had the aim to really sink the ship and we're gonna discuss the details in regards to that fact then number two after the attack there is the attempt to disappear the evidence yeah by sending a a a ship with i don't know you said 40 by 40 foot hole on its side, taking water a thousand miles over the ocean. That's number two. Then if we, if we can, uh, the US uh, government cover up because there clearly was a cover up. There's, this is not a conspiracy uh, theory. And then of course the geopolitical context. Yeah. And one of the items that I would like to discuss is Operation Cyanide. Yeah. But Absolutely. first, but first coming back to you, Phil, I don't know how to tackle this best because it's a it's a massive topic, yeah. But for people who have not heard about this story, could you could you tell us the the comprised encapsulated um, events that happened on that tragic day on this nice day, blue skies, a couple of a couple of clouds, clear water, and suddenly all hell broke loose. Yes, sir. Uh, we were uh, we were sent to the Eastern Med. We were in uh, a port in Africa. We got emergency orders to get underway as soon as possible. This was before the before we even knew the war was on. And so we were and if sent you say, from Africa. Sorry, if if you say we, who is we? Who who? What type of ship was the U.S. Liberty? What type of people were on board? What what did the boat do? Well, the, the boat obviously was a United States Naval uh, intelligence gathering ship. In fact, it was one of the finest spy ships in the world at that time, whether it be America or anybody else. We had the best. In fact, we could we could bounce signals off the moon and get them back to the National Security Agency, National Security Agency within three seconds. That's pretty amazing. Back in 1967, you can only imagine what they can do today with satellites and everything. But uh, yeah, our ship was uh, manned by national security personnel, CIA personnel, and uh, of course, ship's company. That I was in ship's company. Uh, two thirds of the ship, as I said, were spies, the best in the world uh, that this country could offer. So we get we get through the uh, rocket Gibraltar, rocket Gibraltar, excuse me, and we get into the Med, and we could see Israeli aircraft. Even the day before that, reconning our ship, we could clearly make out the markings on the ship. They were Israeli. So we felt pretty good about that. Our best friends in the whole wide world are there. We're in a war zone. And uh, they're there to protect us. Uh, but uh, that wasn't the case. We and asked. So, for, sorry, uh, if, if, if I understood correctly, yeah. Um, in one of those interviews that I saw from you, you said it was quite a surprise deployment, right? Some people on the boat uh, heard it only the day before, and the boat went full speed into the into the area. Is that right? Yes, we were uh, as fast as we could go to get there. In fact, the ship is an old World War II uh, Kai or Kaiser ship. They called them one wayers, victory ship. And it was converted into an intelligence gathering ship in uh, 1965. 
Yeah. Is it so, normal that, yeah. that the US Navy sends a single ship into an active war zone? Is that something normal? Well, for us, it was normal. I'll tell you why. Because we always sailed alone. We didn't have any escorts or anything like this. But at that time, in a war zone, the captain requested to have at least a destroyer escort or destroyer or some kind of backup, just in case. We were told, well, I wasn't told personally. I found this out later. The captain was told, don't worry about it. You're in international waters. You're a threat to nobody, in which we weren't. We were picking up signals out of the sky like everybody else does. Perfectly legal. We weren't doing anything illegal in international waters. We were there to do what our country told us to do, a spy. And that's what we were doing. And then I saw, I actually saw video clips yeah, from sailors on the boat because what I found, it was quite unusual. Uh, this, this was not a, a normal boat because everybody was wearing pristine white clothing. Yeah, uh, There was a barbecue on deck. People were actually taking a sunbathe on the deck just minutes before the attack. Is that correct? Yes, that, that was normal for us. Uh, we always did that. You know, uh, if you're not on duty or on watch, you could go on deck and sunbathe and things like that. At that particular time, I don't know if there was any barbecues going on. I don't think so. But we did that on previous cruises. Uh, but you could clearly see we were an uh, American ship. We had uh, AGTR-5 on the on the bow of our ship on both sides, which, which means uh, auxiliary geographic technical research ship and we were number five in that class number five liberty was in the five so uh our our mission of course as i said was spying and we would do that we'd go up and down the coast about five knots and we had a we had overflights uh all day long uh, until the attack started so on june the 8th and that particular day when the attack started, there were already overflights, I think, since early morning, right? Yes, absolutely. And uh, they would they would come by and dip their wings. Everything was very friendly. They'd wave at us. We'd wave at them. We were very comfortable because we, we thought the Arabs were going to come get us. We, we had no idea. And... Uh, but, but for clarity, do, those, those airplanes, they were Israeli airplanes, right? Those overflight airplanes. Absolutely. They were positively identified as Israeli with the star David on them. There's no question about it. They knew who we were. Our American flag was always flying. Their excuse was they never saw any flag. Or, I mean, it's just completely ridiculous, but we can get in that later. But uh, it was uh, a clear day, calm skies. We had about 12 knots of wind coming over the deck. Plenty of wind to keep a flag out flirling beautifully as our American flag always was and at suddenly around two o'clock the attack started so how long were those overflights how, before that how long how long were those overflights how many hours oh four or five hours before the ship was attacked yeah. so it was not and a that, brief a brief incidental flyby it was really an investigation right yes it was over and over again they kept on going over us, flying boxcars and other airplanes. What they were doing, they were taking photos of the ship so they could hit everything they wanted to hit on that ship in the first, first few seconds. And that's exactly what they did. So first you had the overflights and then came what kind of airplanes and how, how did you realize what's going on? Well, uh, we found out later, uh, of course, uh, they were Israeli, but they were blackened. The, 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 the uh, airplanes were black. You couldn't see any markings on them. So in, in our minds, you know, we have no idea who's attacking us. No idea. We figured it yeah. was uh, Egypt. And if you say attack, what, what exactly? I mean, what do I have to picture? Well, what you have to picture is 12 Mystere Mirage jets attacking us over and over and over and over again for 25 minutes. That's a long time. It's a long time to be attacked. You have nowhere to run, nowhere to hide on that ship. Believe me. They hit every 
tuning antenna on that ship within the first three seconds of the attack. So we were incommunicado. We had no way to communicate with the Sixth Fleet or anybody else for that matter. The radioman, Terry Haldabardier, strung a long wire to a tuner that he had taken off line because it wasn't functioning correctly. He, that's the only reason they didn't hit that tuner. He ran a long wire, a coaxial cable to the tuner. They got the communication out, out, Rockstar, Rockstar, under attack by unknown jet aircraft. Rockstar, Rockstar, we're under attack. USS uh, America picked it up, picked it up. USS Saratoga picked it up. It even, it even was picked up in Vietnam. It was picked up in Vietnam. That's how far the signal went out. Jet aircraft were sent from the USS Saratoga and the USS America. Those aircraft were called by LBJ and Robert McNamara. And we're going to come to Did that. Not... We, we're going to come okay. to that. Yeah. But, okay. but I still would like to flesh out a little bit more the attack. Yeah. So what you said, I mean, the, the, the detail with the antennas is, is significant yeah? because there is more. Yeah? They, they, they did not only take out the antennas. What happened with the, with the signals and the jamming of the signals? Yes. It was, every time they would make a pass at us and fire, uh, uh, they would jam the American signals. All frequencies were jammed. All five uh, our tactical signals were blocked. We, we couldn't get a message out. The only reason we did get a message out is uh, during the attack, it, it didn't jam that time. So for some reason, I don't know. I don't know the technicalities about it. I'm not that smart. But others are. But the, the information got out. The alarm was set. The attack continued. Well, for, first, let me say this. There were 850 cannon rocket holes in the ship. Over 5,000 armor piercing bullets in the ship. Napalm dropped on the bridge of the ship to burn us up. Uh, we can get into the torpedo boats. Uh, if you'd like, whatever you want, you know, we'll go from there. Yeah. So just one thing. So you said the attack took 25 minutes. Now, I heard it took a bit longer. Yeah? Someone said the attack took longer than the attack on Pearl Harbor. Oh, it did. The attack didn't end with the... Uh, airplanes the jet aircraft trying to just kill us all when they were done with us the torpedo boats came up and we we, we saw the star david on the torpedo boats and he says oh great our buddies are here to help us no they weren't they were here to, there to murder us all to put us on the bottom and they almost did the attack lasted as long as the attack on pearl harbor as you said and what they did when they sent the uh, torpedo boats, we thought the attack was over to begin with when the airplanes quit uh, firing on us. And then when the torpedo boats got there, we thought they were there to help us, and we thought the attack was completely over. Oh, no, it wasn't over. They fired five torpedoes at us, Thomas, five torpedoes. Excuse me. And only one of them hit the ship, by the grace of God. It hit an I-beam in the, electro, uh, the uh, CT spaces, the spy spaces, and they, that torpedo exploded prematurely on the outside of the ship. And then it, it blew inward into the ship and outward. That's where 25 of America's finest CIA and NSA personnel were slaughtered, blown to bits. They, after that, they circled our ship and circled our ship and machine gun to machine gun, machine gun, doing everything they could do to kill us, destroy us all. We put over three life rafts. We only had three life rafts left out of uh, uh, as many as the crew could to get, 294 souls. We had enough life rafts for them, all of them. But they, the Israelis destroyed all of them. They shot them up on purpose or burned them up. There were only three left. We put them over the side. The torpedo boats wouldn't have any of that. They machine gunned the three life rafts, or two life rafts. They sunk those and took one aboard their boat as a trophy of their kill. After that, the attack still didn't end. Here comes troop uh, carrying helicopters to finish this off and scuttle the ship. 
They were going to board the ship, kill us all, and scuttle the ship. That's exactly what their plans were. They got a message that help was on the way, which it never was. Help never did come till 17 hours later. If they would just continued on with their vicious slaughtering attack, they could have killed us all and still been none the wiser. They would have blamed it on Egypt, and we'd have gotten into World War III. That was the plan. We were set up by our own government with the uh, Israel uh, more than happy to do the murdering. And then they uh, they said, well, we're sorry. Uh, we didn't know who we were. you were. We thought you were the El Khazur in a horse transport. It was in port in Alexandria. So, I mean, there's so many different complexities to this story. It is uh, mind-boggling. And to be covered up for 56 plus years, be 57 in June, and our own government still from LBJ to Biden, not one Congress person, not one Congress, a group of Congress would support us or any president from LBJ to Biden. They won't touch it. They will not touch it. I wonder why. Uh, you just said something that the official response was and partially still is i'm not entirely sure that, that it was a case of mistaken identity right that still peddled yep. yeah but i want to make it very clear and i invite everybody to to listen to the tape which is now available the israelis taped the israeli military taped this uh, attack yeah they taped the communications between the between the pilots and the ground control yeah and it is clear so there is absolutely no doubt that the Israelis knew this two things. First of all, the Israelis knew it was an Israeli sh uh, a U.S. ship, and they also wanted to sink it and without any survivors. Now, I have a little statement here. This is from Steve Forslund. He's an intelligence analyst of the 455th Air Reconnaissance Technical Wing. He looked at this tape, and, and he said that the tape stated the ground. So, the ground control station ordered the aircrafts to attack and sink the target and ensure they left no survivors. Yeah. Now, there is an Al Jazeera documentary out there on that topic. And in this, in this documentary, you can hear yourself the tapes. Yeah. So I want to make this very clear. There is no, no doubt whatsoever that the Israelis knew before they attacked that this was a U.S. ship. Yeah, I have one more comment here. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Arthur Goldberg, warned Israel that the U.S. had the audio tapes, which proved that the, Israelis, that the Israeli pilots knew they were attacking a U.S. ship before the attacks. And interestingly, some of those pilots, they were puzzled. They, they double-checked with the ground control. Are you sure? Are you sure? And the ground, ground control confirmed, yes, it's an American ship, and yes, you have to attack. Right. Um, another interesting comment on that specific topic, the Israeli ambassador, and that, that's really interesting. Yeah, The Israeli ambassador in Washington sent a secret telecom to Tel Aviv and said Israel is guilty. Evidence is the audio tape of the attack, which was known to top Israeli officials. And I quote what he actually said, they should own up to what they have done and be put on trial. I mean, I find this extraordinary because, because it comes from the Israeli ambassador to in Washington. Right. So again, I just want to highlight this at the very beginning. There is no doubt whatsoever that the Israelis knew exactly what they were doing. And then, of course, there comes the question: Why did they did? Why did they do what they did? Yeah. But we come to this. We come to this later. Yeah. So there was a court of inquiry in June 1967, but it took like seven, eight days. Right. Only seven or eight days. Right. Absolutely. It. Uh... It began with uh, Admiral Isaac Kidd coming aboard our ship, along with his JAG officer, Captain Ward Boston. They interviewed the crew members that were still left aboard Liberty. Most of them were ferried off to the USS America or other ships for definitive care. They were so badly wounded. Now, you must remember, two-thirds of the crew were either dead or wounded. So we had a skeleton crew aboard that ship. Yeah, maybe we, maybe we should make this more specific. Yeah? So there were about 300, 294 Four. souls on board, I believe. How many were wounded, how many were dead, and how many were survived? 
34 killed, 174 wounded, and uh, that's two-thirds of the ship gone, either dead or wounded. It was uh, very savage. In fact, I even hate to think back about the men that were all over the decks in the mess hall, laying on tables with mattresses on them. We had to get from the bunks these poor men suffering from horrific wounds, from head wounds to well, I, I just can't tell you all the wounds that were so numerous, so many of them. I was wounded, but I was walking wounded. I was very fortunate. And I got to stay with the ship, which I, which I was very proud to do. But Admiral Kidd and Boston came aboard the ship while we were at sea, headed to Malta. And he talked to us, Thomas, in person. I was one of four or five people in sick bay. That's where we met up with the Admiral. And he asked each of us what we saw, what we thought, and he would respond to that. So we felt very good. In fact, he took off his stars, off his lapel, and threw them on the the uh, stainless steel table. It sounded like a bell. And we felt very good about that. He said, <clears throat> I'm just like your dad. Tell me exactly what happened. I want to know to get to the bottom of this. And we did. I told them exactly what I thought, why help didn't come, how come Israel would do this, uh, are they going to be held accountable, uh, how many people are d d have died on Saratoga or wherever they went. I would like to, I wanted to know how many other of my shipmates were killed. Of course, we had 25 in the hole, which I didn't know how many were down there then, but we found out at Malta. But he, <clears throat> he was very stern and very passionate. And then he became very evil. He put his stars back on. And he said, if you ever repeat a word to anybody, uh, your parents, anybody, especially the news, I promise you, you will go to, you will get fined, go to prison, or worse. We all know wor what worse meant, death. So our First Amendment rights were stricken from us. They took our First Amendment rights of freedom of speech with consequences, terrible consequences. We just went through the most horrific attack a person could go through. And then he puts us through more hell, telling us to shut up so Israel can get by with cold-blooded, premeditated murder along with the help of our government that sent us there to be set up to be sunk by Israel and blame it on Nasser. That's exactly the, the sum of it. Of course, there's a lot more that goes into this, but that's exactly what the plan was. This plan was probably put in motion maybe a year, six months before it ever happened. Frontlet 615, uh, I think that, uh, uh, and the 303 committee, I'm sure you've heard of those. The attack was supposed to take place on the 15th of June attacking our ship, but Israel got antsy and started the war early. That's why they rushed us into the Med so quick, because we were the, the sacrificial lambs. In fact, there was a, another ship, there was an intelligence ship called the Valdez that was manned by civilians. They could have done the same thing we were doing, but they took them out of the area and sent us into the area, because I guess the Valdez didn't sound as sexy as, as uh, sinking uh, USS Liberty. And, you know, Liberty is a big thing to this country. Mm. And so they wanted to make a big splash. Hey, yeah. Egypt just sunk the Liberty. What do you think this country would have done? The outcry from the, from the people of America would have been overwhelming. Bury them. That's what, that's what they wanted to do. That's yeah. what Israel wanted. It was all a and, land grab. And we're going we're gonna to come to that. We're going to come to that. Yeah. So now you still have the, the Admiral there on the boat. And again, to 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 keep a picture in in people's uh, in people's mind, yeah, you had a forty by forty foot hole in the side of your ship, and I heard, I think it was Larry. You and Larry were on another show, and I believe it was Larry who said he was. I mean, the water came in till another steel wall, and Larry and you, you were on the other side of this steel wall, which is actually not designed to keep water pressure out, yeah. So they they reinforced this. I think it was you 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 said right. You you reinforced this wall from the inside with wood, 
yeah and all 30 45 minutes you check the wood if it's still stable because if that wall would have broken the boat still would have sunk right yes yes that was that was on our way to uh Malta, to Malta. uh yeah. people from the USS uh Davis came over to help us do that they called it a knee wall and it was just a a big case what it was put up against the wall the the deck uh, excuse me the bulkhead and it was round the bulkhead was bulging out that's that's how close it was to going through the whole ship but the davis did a fine job i helped him to it, uh do it as well i was in that that part of the i was in damage control so that was my job i had to do it well i wanted to do it let's put it that way i didn't have any choice i wanted to do it so the uh the knee wall if it breaks we flood the ship goes down uh, by the grace of god again we made it into malta uh, to a safe port but we could have went to crete we were sent a thousand miles away when we should have went to crete why i wanted to, to, to ask you away? i wanted to ask you is there any logical explanation why you sent a thousand miles over the ocean when you could simply have gone to greece well, I guess it's the same reason as they attacked us. They wanted us to sink. They want all evidence taken care of. They didn't want us around. Our only sin was, Thomas, is we stayed alive to tell the truth. And we've been labeled Nazis, Jew haters, and anti-Semitic pigs just because we stayed alive. And our government won't listen to us. Nobody listens to us. Yeah, so today, even a couple of weeks ago, Netanyahu said, Who, whoever criticizes Israel or whoever criticizes Zionism is an anti-Zionist, a Jew hater. Yeah. So that, that trend of that line of argumentation, uh, you know, went through all the, all the way from, from 1948 till, uh, till now. Yeah. But there were some other interesting things. So you said the Admiral uh, forbade you all to talk about by, it's basically a gag order, right? Yes, absolutely. It was a gag order. With, with very stringent uh, consequences if you disobeyed those orders. And my, personally, myself, I didn't talk about it for 20 years. I forgot about the USS Liberty. I really did. You, and, thought, you uh, forgot about it or you buried it deep down? Well, I guess you could say it was both buried and forgot about it. I didn't even tell my... I, I remarried after my first wife, uh, and I didn't even tell my second wife, well, I'm still married to uh, for 41 years. God bless her. I love her deep, deeply. And she stuck with me through the whole deal. But when I got married to her, I never told her I was in the military. I, I just, that part of my life was gone. And then an article came out uh, from Stan White. He has since passed on. He was a master chief spy. It was an E-9 chief. A great gentleman, friend of mine, a great friend. I'm sorry he's gone, but he uh, got a hold of me and said, we have an organization now. It's called the USS Liberty Veterans Organization. I said, wow, you guys are speaking out? He says, yeah. I says, I felt like the whole world just came off my shoulders. So I started speaking, and I haven't quit for the last 41 years. I've been speaking about it. So it's a, been a long time, and I, I didn't start the organization. I became part of it. I'm a four-time president, and I'm very proud to be a part of this organization with, with the, the great men in liberty, uh, a great crew of people, uh, dedicated men that love this country more than anything, and our country shits on us. That's just, just a fair statement. And this is a segue to how I came to you, because there was uh, an interviewee of mine, Ken O'Keefe, a former U.S. Mar Marine who was on, who participated on the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. And he mentioned your name and he brought to the two of us into contact. And he also sent me the New Hampshire committee hearing from January 2024. And amazingly, this hearing from January 2024 is the first formal, unless you tell me otherwise, yeah, but to my knowledge, it's the first formal hearing ever since 1967. Yes, uh, Ken, uh, Ken was on the Mari Marv, I, I believe it was. Is that the name of the ship uh, that yeah. went over there? And 
uh, and they att they attacked that ship. They uh, the Israelis attacked that ship too and killed ten people. Yeah. Yes, yes, they did, and I'm surprised N nothing has uh, never been made of that. But I mean, so what? They killed a couple of people, huh? So what? They killed 34 Americans on the high seas. So what? They injured 100, 174. And how many other uh, nefarious things have they done to this country, all in the for the greater good of Israel? And you know what's interesting? Well, it's not really interesting. It's a fact. Well, it is interesting and a fact. Our Congress in this country will not lift a finger, not, not unless Israel is involved. Saying that, what I mean is, if you say anything bad about Israel, you write about, write to your congressman and tell them, hey, we want an investigation. And they'll say, well, we've already had investigations. They never had. They're liars. They're all liars. We've never had a full-fledged uh, investigation. The only investigation we got is from the Navy Board of Inquiry, which was a sham, a complete sham, a whitewash. Uh, Dean Russ, uh, former uh, Secretary of State, said, hey, this was no mistake. You don't repeatedly do this over and over and over again. And... Uh, he said, it remains a scar on relations between the United States and Israel, along with uh, Undersecretary George Ball, courageous George Ball. He says, in one of his writings, a nice whitewash. Admiral Thomas Moore, uh, he was a former uh, commander of Europe forces in Atlantic. He's the only admiral to do that, be, be in charge of both Europe and uh the Pacific fleets. Now, this wasn't at the same time. It was at different times. Then he went on to become chief of naval operations. Then he became uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he's one of the best friends of the USS Liberty ever had. He has passed on a, a since. But uh, his voice is still strong, along with all the other people. If they're passed on or not, their voices are very strong and very accurate. This country will not do anything Israel for anything it does is murdering, murdering Americans on, on the high seas. What, what can't they get by with? Yeah, we lost it there for a second, uh, Phil, but you're back now. So, but but okay. it's clear that's clear that uh, the Israeli interest group are deeply embedded in not only the American Congress uh, but in in the American government uh, itself up to the highest levels. Yeah, um, I have something so. I saw the New Hampshire committee hearing, yeah, and I was surprised by two things. First of all, you all, you, there were several of the survivors there. You traveled a considerable distance to participate, and then they gave you somewhere between two and three minutes to speak. I mean, I was, I was really surprised. Why was that? That's the first thing. And second, did, I mean, it was just, just in general, yeah, but have there been any concrete outcomes of that, of that uh, committee? Not that I'm aware of as yet. They're supposed to reconvene. I believe it's uh, in the next next week on the 20th of uh, March. But you're right. I was surprised as anybody in there. They only have a limited amount of time to speak, and we were rushed out to, supposedly to a news conference that never took place. <laughs> so there were I. You know, I uh, this is still in in uh, the hands of the uh, Congress of New Hampshire. So I don't know what they're going to do if they're going to get a committee together to investigate, which has never been investigated, or are they going to table it and table it, table it and forget it? I I don't know. I hope they do the right thing for not just us, but for America and the world. The world needs the truth. Hmm. They don't need these lies. Before we discuss the, uh, let's say, the big story to that, yeah, that there's one element that I would like to uh, to flesh out a little bit, yeah. So you you said already, for miraculous reasons, you were you were able to get distress calls out, and these distress calls were actually caught by the Sixth Fleet, and the Commander Admiral, what's his name? I have it somewhere. John McCain. No, Tolly, Captain Tolly from the USS Sarag Saratoga, oh, yeah. right? Right. It's Captain airplane. Tully. Yeah. He sent airplanes, right? What happened? Yes, he did. 
What happened? He sent he sent aircraft. He sent one one, one volley off. They were recalled, and to his surprise, this is his words, not mine. The America did not launch at that time, but he launched immediately when he heard the distress call. Those planes were recalled even before they hit the horizon, returned to base, returned to base. He returned his planes to base, and then he, he, he sent another volley off again. That's when uh, Johnson got on the phone. Said he President, hire President Johnson, President. you mean, yeah? Yeah, L LBJ. I call him LBJ the snake. But uh, LBJ gets on the, on the uh, line and tells whoever is uh, taking the communications from America or Saratoga or any of the support groups, uh, return to base. I could give a GD if a few dead sailors die. I'm not going to embarrass my ally, Israel. So he loved, he knew what was coming. The torpedo boats was coming. He knew all that, but he wanted us at the bottom of the ocean so he could continue his war. This is in another documentary, Sacrificing Liberty. People need to go to that, Sacrificing Liberty. Just type that in. You can rent it or buy it, but it's one of the best docu-series ever made about the USS Liberty. A lot of survivors, dignitaries. It's fabulous. You should watch it too, please, Thomas, if you would. Give I me will. a lot of insight. I will. And Captain Tully was fired afterwards, right? Lost his job. Yes, he was. He lost his command because he came to help us. He came to one of our reunions, uh, and he had throat cancer, Tom. He had throat cancer. He came to, I believe, one or two of our reunions. And he was in uniform, he was an older man, dying of cancer. And uh, he, uh, he says, I'm sorry I couldn't come to help you. I tried. And he started crying. They ruined his career. He was a, a, a famous fighter, a, a fighter pilot in World War II. And uh, look what they did to him, all for the greater good of Israel. They fired that man for helping us, trying to help us. Sad story, sad story. Now, we can come to President Johnson and Robert McNamara. Now, I have a couple of notes here from various sources. Yeah. Now, after the attack, President Johnson had spoken informally to Newsweek magazine and told them, also informally, yeah, and told them that Israel had attacked the USS Liberty because it collected intelligence about Israel. There were some there were some tricky stuff because, if I'm not mistaken, um, Israel promised America not to preemptively attack, but they did all kinds of stuff. So there might, may have been some reason that uh, Israel didn't want American intelligence um, collect, you know, the information that, that, that they're having. Yeah, but the fact that Johnson said this to Newsweek magazine was leaked. Yeah. Declassified documents show that Israel threatened Johnson with blood libel. Yeah. The problem was that Johnson had an election coming up. Well, actually had the Vietnam War going on and he had an election coming up in 1968. Right. Now, at that time, the Washington Post wrote that the Jewish lobby could determine the outcome of 169 of the 270 electoral votes needed to win the White House. So that's why Johnson was quite receptive towards the Israeli pressure. Yeah? And then there come two things. Yeah, He got two gifts. So President Johnson got two gifts from Israel to keep the story quiet. Yeah, First of all, the Jewish community would stop opposing the Vietnam War because at the time the Jewish community was actually quite stance against the Vietnam War. But more importantly, in the Vietnam War, the Americans lost a lot of their fighters to surface to, to Russian surface to air missiles. Now, these were the same missiles that Egypt that Egypt used, and Israel had captured a whole installation, the launching plus the record the, 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 the rockets, and gave them to to uh, to America so that they could so that America could design countermeasures. Yeah. So those were two concrete gifts 
that Israel gave to Johnson to keep the whole USS Liberty story quiet. Yeah, But that means basically that an American president, and this is why this is so relevant today, Phil, yeah? This cannot be over, this cannot be overstated. And again, we are not against the Jewish people. This is such a nonsense. And I, I talk to a lot of uh, uh, Jewish academics, yeah, who say exactly the same. Criticizing the state of Israel is not the same as as, as being anti-Semitism or or hating Jews. That's not what we do, yeah. But it's clear that then, as as also now, Israel manipulates the government of. America, yeah, and in that case, it was manipulating President Johnson for the interests, for their own interests, against the interests of America. And this is this is really interesting how far politicians go to further their own interests, as you said, a couple of dead sailors on the sea. Right, and uh, let me go back to uh, the first part when uh, Johnson said what he said. Now, I can tell you emphatically that our spies aboard that ship, they were ordered, if you pick up anything from United Kingdom or Israel, you were to drop it immediately. Do not listen to, in, to any of their conversations. We weren't listening to Israel. We were listening to everybody else, but we weren't listening to Israel. And if we did pick up something, they dropped it immediately. So we weren't spying on Israel. That's a fact. That's And, and Johnson, uh, I, I just can't. That guy there just uh, makes me want to, he gets me mad. But uh, the, the Jewish people, no, we're not, I'm not mad at the Jewish people. They're governed by, People sometimes they don't have their best interests at heart. Same thing in America. The government does things that aren't good for the American people, but they do it anyway. Think Vietnam was good for the American people? Korea? World War One? All of them could have been prevented. And I've studied this quite a bit. If things would have been just a little bit different. Admiral Arlie Burke, he said, Phil, things are made to happen. They're caused to happen. They just don't happen. This is well thought out and pre-planned, the attack on liberty. And 58,000 plus men in Vietnam died for what? Iraq. Weapons of yeah. uh, mass destruction. That's another one. George Bush, what a liar. Iraq is a special example because we have Secretary of State Madeleine Albright stating on, I believe it was CNBC, that she found it worth it that 500,000 Iraqi children were starved to death. And this is the bridge to Israel. The, there are coming pictures out right now from Gaza where someone compared the Nazi concentration camp uh, starved people with the children's starved bodies of today in Gaza. And they're interchangeable. Yeah. So a human life is worth nothing Yeah, on, the, on those levels. No, it isn't. And here we sit talking to each other about a very important subject. And there's nothing more important than human lives, especially little children who don't have a say in anything. And they're suffering this horrible death of starvation or being blown up by Israeli bombs or rockets. But again, I, I, I can't stress enough. Our fight is not with the Israeli people. Our fight is with the government and what governments will do to other people, regardless who it is. And Israel is embedded in our government so deep, they can do anything they want without any consequences. Now, how does this come about over and over and over again? Okay, here's a good example. Cynthia McKinney, she was a black uh, Democrat, I believe, from... Maybe it was Georgia or somewhere down south. I can't remember. But she was told you have to take an oath to Israel before being a Congress member. You have to support Israel at all costs. She took umbrage with that, and they got rid of her. She was gone. So the power of the ADL 
the Israeli lobby, APAC, all of them, bear out on America. We're the richest country. We have some of the meanest weapons in the world, and everybody wants them. And we freely give them to countries to make war to kill other people. This country needs to stay out of wars in Europe, out of wars in the Middle East. It's got to stop. Now, I wonder, I wonder how Joe Biden's going to figure that one out. I, think, I hope the American people do and get rid of him by vote this coming November. Who is the, who Maybe, is the alternative? Well, the only alternative is Donald Trump. And I know he, he likes Israel, too. But uh, there's a difference between Trump, and, and I, I, I frame it this way. Donald Trump, when he got the Abra Abraham Accords done, although I didn't like all of it, I thought to myself, well, if this keeps peace in the Middle East and no one dies on either side, or no American soldier, or, uh, soldiers and sailors or Marines are put in ha harm's way, That's a good thing. But now look at it now. The world's exploding around us. And uh, I'm sure in your neck of the woods, they're not too happy about that either because what happens, what happens to America happens to the world. What happens to Israel happens to the world. And uh, that, that's my mindset. That's the best way I can explain it. What, what happens around the world now with the obvious decline i have to say of american power you know the the unipolar moment which lasted about 30 years for america is over there's no question about that and as a consequence we have these regional wars popping up left and right yeah question is how far will this go can we rein this in right so at the moment it looks everywhere that the powers to be are doing everything they can to expand the wars not you know not to rein them in it's, it's it's crazy yeah it doesn't matter if it's in israel if it's uh in this 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 us russia proxy war in in ukraine france is now getting involved yeah it's 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 amazing to see as an outsider now imagine you are let's say an alien and you come to the you come to our little planet for the first time and the first thing you see this planet is armed to the teeth but the, the the paradox is these stupid people they aim their own weapons onto themselves yeah i mean this this is in the 21st century where, where you would think you know the the enlightenment has taken place it's something that's that's really hard to understand it is and it's uh it's hard it's hard for in my view, the whole world to view this and to see it and what could come. Uh, Putin, I know we're getting off subject of the liberty, but this is important. Putin is threatening nuclear nuclear war, nuclear holocaust, if uh, things don't go his way, if uh, the West gets involved in anymore. And now Biden wants to send 300 million, I guess, 300 million more dollars of weapons to Ukraine, that, that's good enough for, oh, a few days, three days, and those are all used up. So where does it end, Thomas? I have no idea. Hmm. It's a good segue back to, to the liberty. You said nuclear. yeah. So let's talk about Operation Cyanide. First of all, what do you know about it? Operation Cyanide was a, a, a secret operation. Operation Cyanide, does that goes along with Frontlet 615, is that correct? I don't know what that what the article was, but it, it has to do with the nuclear topic and, and, and oh, geopolitics. Yeah. yeah. And it, it has to do with the fact that what you said at the very beginning, that you said that you thought this was planned at least a year in advance. So if it was if it was Lee Hop, that's an expression from the Swiss historian Dr. Daniel Eleganza, who I've interviewed, Lee Hop let it happen on purpose right then this is where this is where this topic comes in the attack was not a mistake i have a couple of notes in front of me yeah but the deliberate action linked to a broader covert operation right in order to draw america into a war right now the the key point of this operation Cyanide was that there were apparently a russian nuclear submarines in the area and 
America apparently was prepared to attack, and this is actually something about the about the airplanes, right? Uh, question for me, for for you. And America apparently was prepared to attack um, Egypt with nuclear weapons at that time. Yeah, is that something that you could uh, that you are aware of? Yes, 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 very much so. The wheels were put in motion for a nuclear uh, strike on Egypt. The planes were in the air, headed to Cairo to annihilate them. And the point being, us not sinking, that was the pretext of war. Us sinking, going to a nuclear conflict. As I said earlier, the American people would have been outraged. They would have been screaming for blood to destroy the people that destroyed 294 American sailors, Marines, aboard the, our spy ship USS Liberty. But we didn't sink. We were uh, close to three or four minutes away from a, a nuclear exchange. There were subs there from, from Russia. There were subs there from the United States of America. USS Amberjack and USS uh, Samuel Jackson were beneath us. So, yeah, that, that, that was going to happen. And in Sacrificing Liberty, they highlight that very heavily. It's a must-see, Sacrificing Liberty. Just type it out. You'll come right to it. It's amazing. You'll learn a lot right there. Hmm. But no, we were, we were, we were close to World War Three. Both the two elements which are not which are not a precedent. Yeah. So first of all, a couple of uh, years earlier, we had the Tonkin incident in uh, in in Vietnam, right? Totally fabricated story, also involving a ship uh, supposedly attacked. Yeah. And then in the Cuban crisis, right? We know from the Kennedy tapes, so not only Nixon taped his White House, Kennedy also taped his White House. So we know from the Kennedy tapes that uh, the combined chiefs of staff urged Kennedy to authorize a first strike on both Russia and China yeah, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So it's not completely out of thin air to assume that America would attack uh, Egypt with a nuclear weapon. Right. Oh, it, uh, absolutely. It uh, is very much that was the plan. That was a plan drawn up long before we got in the med. I don't know how far back it went, but it, it was all drawn up on paper. And it was uh, as uh, one of my shipmates uh, said, Commander David Lewis, he was in charge of all the spies aboard the ship. It was a perfectly executed attack by Israel. They did everything they were supposed to do. They knocked our communications out. They took our 450 caliber machine guns out. We, we were incommunicado. They uh, sent torpedo boats to sink us, and then the helicopters off to pick pick out uh, uh, to <clears throat> excuse me pick up uh, pick off survivors. So <clears throat> that was a plan, but we spoiled their their uh, murderous attempt at uh, at war, and uh, that's why this. USS Liberty story is so covered up. If it was so cut and dry, Thomas, how come the the Congress hasn't gotten us in front of Congress to tell them our side of the story rather than a bunch of lies that they want to perforate, perforate on the United States of America for 57 and a half years? You know, there, there's something that really smells here and it, it smells real, real bad. And the people, I think the people of America would be outraged, more than outraged, if they found out what they did to us because it's been going on for the last 57-plus years, even before our ship got hit. We don't know about him yet, how many other false flags. Now, you talked about the USS Maddox. Uh, I got aboard the uh, USS Maddox when I got, uh, I got out of the Navy because I wanted nothing to do with it. It was in the 70s. Uh, see, I got out in 67. I rejoined in the 70s. Guess what ship I got uh, sent to? USS Maddox. That was my duty station aboard the Maddox. And I talked to guys there that were, were there during the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. And they said it was all BS. It was all made up. So you're right. Gulf of Tonkin, that got us into Vietnam. And, and uh, it was all on false pretexts. It's kind of funny. I go for, to the Liberty, to the Maddox, and fi find out what I didn't know, but made very good sense to me 
when they told me this, because I told them about the liberty. I was talking to personally. Now, I wasn't out, out speaking to a bunch of people on, in the news or whatever. I just told them I was aboard the liberty, and they knew about it. And they told me what their circumstances was. Yeah. So to make this more specific for, for people who do not know, yeah, so the USS Maddox was the boat in the Gulf of Tonkin, right? Yes. yes. They were supposed, supposedly fired on. Uh, USS Maddox, DD-731. That's the boat on which the Vietnam War was pinned to start, right? Yes, on a, on a, on a fake On a fake story, yeah. Coming back to what you said, it, it's really, you know, what what does fate tell you to put you indeed from the Liberty onto the Maddox? It, it, it's a really interesting, uh, interesting, yeah. Uh, well, I didn't know how, how that could happen, but it did. And uh, it was a reserve can at that time. We took reservists out on two-week tours. You know, we go up and down the coast of... Uh, like to San Diego, San Francisco, and stuff like that. So it wasn't going overseas, but it was a uh, uh, reserve can to teach reserves, you know, to stay sharp. But uh, that ship has a lot of history as well as the USS Liberty. But the USS Liberty was sold for pennies on the dollar. And they turned it into razor blades to get rid of the evidence. Now, we were when we were in Malta, they fixed it all up to like make it look like a brand new ship. They painted it covered up all the holes which you could still see where the holes were all covered up but it's not like having gigantic holes all over the ship you know you could you couldn't see them anymore but yeah. uh, the evidence was still there they were they were trying from what i understood to prevent any uh, pictures being taken from from the damaged boat and they had a lot of damage control uh trying to keep the media out so i saw a witness from a um video of one of the victims on the boat yeah and she said for weeks she had nsa handlers in her house living in her house just to make sure that she has no contact with anyone from the press and she was probably not the only one. Oh my she was an analyst no she was a widow of one of those uh, uh men who died on the on the uss liberty yeah, yeah. You, you're talking about pat blue that might be i don't i didn't record her name yeah 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 her husband unfortunately he got on board the ship in malta we picked up uh three marines and one civilian analyst and that was alan blue and little did he know a few days later he would be dead but uh yeah i i can understand and uh you know she went through a lot of a lot of hurt and uh, disappointment. Of course, her husband was just blown to bits, and then to be treated like a to be treated like a uh, a traitor from our government for, to telling her not to say anything uh, it makes a lot of sense of exactly what they told us, doesn't it? Hmm. And coming back to what you said before, so why is it not really being picked up by? by the US government. Yeah, I think, and this is why I said at the very beginning, this story is so relevant today because Israel is embedded today in the US government than it was before. Even, I'm not even sure that's correct to say, I think it's even more so than, than it was in 1967, right? I mean, uh, Biden is the greatest recipient of funds from Israeli in interest groups ever. Yeah. And the same is true for I don't know how many people in the in the Congress. So they, they wouldn't touch a case like this, you know, uh, in, in, in any instance, right? So there is a drive, and I can see this in Europe too. Yeah. There is there is such a feverish strive to to be pro-Israel. Yeah. And I don't I don't understand the reason, yeah. Because it's counterproductive for for their own countries, yeah, like like for Germany, yeah. What what right is should be right and not left, yeah. I mean, I do understand the historical context, you know, the the, the whole guilt, uh, you, you know, I, I do understand, yeah. But we are virtually balancing on the edge of a of the abyss, yeah. To to use a cliche on a on a nuclear war, yeah. So from from your perspective, you just said, you know, I mean. 
I heard the same from from some Vietnam uh, veterans. Yeah, they came home and they were like they were like outcasts. Uh, I don't want to say criminals, but like outcasts. And the same is true. I heard from the survivors of uh, of the Liberty, right? We've been outcasts. We've been a thorn in the government's uh, side for the past 56 and a half years. And, and why won't they investigate the liberty? Well, it's very obvious because they can't handle the truth, as uh, Jack Nicholson famously said in the movie, because you can't handle the truth. And there's the truth here. They can't handle it. They know the truth. They would look like fools trying to protect our government and Israel from the truth. They would be made into fools with the evidence that, that we have, the eyewitness testimony. Uh, Doc Kiefer, he received a silver star aboard our ship. He was wounded badly in his abdomen and his knees, and he, he stood on those legs for hours and hours and hours, saving people's lives. And during the Board of Inquiry, he said this, and he's passed on to, uh, unfortunately, he, he's passed on to, uh, he, he retired as a captain in the Navy, very high honor there. And he was a hell of a doctor, too, to do what he did. He said, why would the Board of Inquiry ignore eyewitness testimony from American servicemen and take on faith what Israel said, what is what happened? Now that tells it all. Why would they take Israel's side on faith of what they said what happened rather than eyewitnesses to cold-blooded premeditated murder on the high seas? They do the same, they do the same, they exactly the same uh, today. If you remember, even Joe Biden uh, repeated a claim that has proven false after the October 7th attacks, you know, of those 40 beheaded babies, yeah? Even the president of the United States said he saw the pictures. And in retrospect, the international press, that's not me claiming, yeah? The international press said this story was fake. That means either Biden was lying or someone fed Biden on faith information that was, that was uh, clearly, clearly incorrect, right? Right. I, I understand that. I, I'm not privy to all the details, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm. I don't know exactly how to how to respond to that other than the fact that all human lives are sacred. I don't care, care who kills them. But what side do you what side do you believe? And what side do you don't believe? Uh, and take one side and not the other. That's like a kangaroo court. That's the same thing that happened to us. They mm -hmm. took the, the, the people that tried to murder us and got by with it. They took their word over American sailors sworn their, their lives to the Constitution of the United States to protect it from all enemies, foreign and domestic. And we're worthless. Our words aren't mean anything. Uh, that is, uh, as an American, that was a one of the biggest slap downs I've ever got in my life, as well as the rest of my crewmates. Now, these these men were brave, wonderful, good men. Now, there were there were two different crews aboard the Liberty. The spies, we weren't allowed to talk to them. They weren't allowed to talk to us. And then the ship's company. But when that ship got hit, we were all one trying to save each other. And I commend each and every one of those men, brave men that helped save that ship. And uh, I might add, uh, we really didn't save it. God saved that ship. We were just his servants that day. And we're still his servants in faith and truth to the American public and the world. This story must, become, must come out before we all die. They're just waiting for us to die out, Tom. They're just waiting for us to die out. That's all they want. And they figure this story is going to go away, but it's not going to go away. We have other people who's going to carry this story on, but it's more it's more relevant, more potent with survivors telling the truth. And that's what we're going to do till the day we die. Absolutely. And I was always wondering, you know, I mean, this is not an isolated incident. I mean, 
America invaded Iraq based on fake information. Yeah, many Americans died. Yeah, many Americans got wounded. Many Americans have traumas, not to mention the Iraqis. Yeah, but I mean, as a U.S. soldier, you see your your own bodies, friends dying. Then you come home and you find out that your own president lied to you. Yeah. I, I always wonder, I mean, do you have now, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of veterans in the in the US from various wars where more and more information comes to pass that, you know, not everything was as it seemed. Yeah. Is there is there no, I don't know, drive within these organizations or even the, the military itself to say, guys. We need to do something. We can't. We cannot continue like this. No, we can't. And I, I look back on the Iraq War. That from that war on, remember shock and awe, how that, how that. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that. With indiscriminately bombing, killing all these people, sending our troops in to fight them. Iraq. Then we get into Afghanistan. Look, that was a 20-year war for what? It was all. It wasn't for the benefit of the United States. Uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, on and on and on. All those men and women that served our country went into a war that we weren't supposed to be there. It was, uh, it's disgusting. It's un-American, and it makes American servicemen look like nothing more than pop-up targets to be used. They put a flag over your, your coffin and said, oh, you were a good boy. Here's a purple heart. And they, they put you in the ground. I mean, it just doesn't make good sense to me. A last, a last little topic, if I, if I may, uh, uh, Phil. Yeah? You, you indicated, I heard it in between, that you're very interested in, in regards to what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah? And I can imagine after your past. I, I, I would be too. Yeah? So how do you view the, the Israel-Palestine conflict yeah? as, as one item? And how do you feel, how do you view the, the Israel-American relation? Yeah? I know it's not a good idea to ask compound questions. So first, how do you feel, uh, view the Israel-Palestine conflict or specifically what's going on in Gaza right now? What is going on in Gaza... Now, I'm speaking my, for myself. I'm not speaking for the crew or anybody else. Uh, these are my personal thoughts. They got, they got attacked. Well, let me, let me start like this. They have a, a checkpoint, a gate, around all of Israel. They got the Iron Dome. You can't, you can't get close to that gate. A little kitten, if they got on that anywhere close, the Israelis could detect it. For some reason, that gate was left open or they, they breached it or whatever, bombed it, breached it. It doesn't make any difference. They got over. Then everything started happening. Now, for the response back from Israel for this unprovoked attack, if that's the way it happened, I, I don't have... I'm not going to get any deeper in that. But the response back from Israel, they're leveling Gaza. They're leveling Gaza and killing and starving people to death. No, I'm not on board with that. I don't care who's doing it. And it must stop and it must stop now. The Palestinians have every right to breathe a breath of fresh air every day as anybody else in this world. They don't know to be run out or slaughtered by a foreign government and be made uh, like they're less human they're not humans that's that's what's coming out of the news they're, they're not really good people they're they're the palestinian people well they they voted in hamas well you know who created hamas israel committed committed uh uh made hamas who they are today they didn't like yasser Arafat, plo that he's gone you got hamas uh which was uh, created by Israel. Now they're fighting each other. So, no, I'm totally against it. And the overwhelming bombing and rocket, rockets they're, ta they're taking and the starvation is a, is a mortal sin, in my view. I have to I have to highlight one thing. You said a critical word. You said unprovoked. Yeah, 
October 7th. If, if we don't rectify this, we're going to be criticized or grilled. Yeah. So that wasn't unprovoked. That's a consequence of 75 years of, uh, of occupation. Yeah. But I understand your point of view. Yeah. I was just wondering, you were attacked by Israel. Yeah. And, you know, there's, of course, some sensitivity here. I completely understand. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not giving Israel a free pass on the USS Liberty either. I am giving mm -hmm. the, the citizens of Israel a free pass. Uh, they, they don't run their government. They're told what to do by their government. And in some ways, they're brainwashed by their government, just as we are here in the United States, brainwashed by the, by the uh, liberal media uh, the, uh, or any media that, uh, that doesn't support Israel. And I, I think most of them do. But uh, they don't know the real facts. Uh, they never mentioned the USS Liberty. Why would they mention the USS Liberty as a counterpoint to, to see what's really going on, wh what's right and what's wrong? So I guess the old saying goes back long ago. It says if Israel can get by with murdering American sailors in the high seas, they'd get by with anything, almost anything, and they're doing it right now. Yeah. And that was all a land grab. They should have investigated then, Thomas. If they investigated the correct way and done it the right way, what's going on in Israel right now wouldn't be happening. That's my viewpoint. Yeah. And you just said brainwashed. I, in I interviewed Professor Nurid Pelet El Hanan, and she studied racism in Israeli school books. She's an Israeli professor, yeah. And she studied uh, racism in Israeli school books. That means Israeli kids get racism indoctrinated into their system from, you know, right after the kindergarten, yeah. And, you know, if you if put this onto America, I mean, there is no longer a really free press in America. There, it's corporate owned, you know, it's, 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 hand, it's hand in hand with, with powerful interests. We could argue there is indoctrination, which is even more dangerous because it's absolutely invisible. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it was in, it, it's indivisible. And it was in 67 too. We were on the front page one day and on the back page the next day, then we weren't on the news at all. So that that's how much they covered uh, our situation, uh, uh, American flagship being attacked by a foreign government, Israel, and it getting a free pass because of a mistaken identity. They committed war crimes, serious, serious war crimes, shooting our life rafts, uh, shooting us indiscriminately on deck. They knew exactly, they, they were vicious. How do people do that? How do... How do people just kill other people like that, uh, especially aboard uh, the Liberty? And I'm not saying our lives are worth any more than others, but this is a prime example of uh, government's gone very, very uh, bad, gone crooked. And I don't think much changed since then to now, if anything. Now we have a messianic, uh, a messianic government in Israel. We have messianic uh, Christians in America between, as I interviewed Noam Chomsky, he said between 60 and 80 million people in America are reading messianic lit literature. Yeah, that means on on both on both sides you have interest group who, based on their religion, hope for a clash of civilizations so that their Messiah can come back. Yeah, it's it's really crazy. Yeah, Phil, did we did we? Is there anything we could still cover that we have not covered? Is there anything that you would like to talk about? Yes, if I, if I may, Thomas, thank of you. Of course, was, of course. Uh, you know, the USS Liberty Organization is a small a small group of people. And uh, we take donations or we invite you to join the USS Liberty Veterans Association. And I can tell you how to do that if you'd spread the word. Now, you're going to send me this information and I'm going to put it, I put it in the description of the video. I think that's best. Then people don't have to write anything down. You sent me this stuff and I put it in the, in the description for everybody to, uh, to access. You can also send me a direct link. Yeah. I think that's the easiest. I, I, okay. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, out of interest. How many survivors are there still? Direct survivors of the attack? About? That's a good question. I, let, let's say this. Anywhere from 50 to 100. So uh, two, 200 of them are, are gone. Yeah. And that, that brings me back past. to, you know, the average age of the soldier in Vietnam was 19, right? So you guys, you were extremely young, yeah? And I'm a behavior analyst, yeah? I can tell you that our neocortex grows till we are between 21 and 23 years old. That means we are sending virtually kids 
into wars whose capacity to think is not yet fully developed. Yeah, It's always the same. Old, war is old men talking and young men dying. It's just incredible. In some countries, we can send them to war and they can't even buy alcohol legally yet. Yeah. It, it's right. just well, incredible. Yeah. So how, how old were I, you? How old were you? I was 20 years old in 1967. Hmm. I joined the Navy. I quit school and joined the Navy at 17 with my parents' permission and uh, did t two tours in Vietnam. And then I got transferred to the uh, East Coast aboard the USS Liberty. Let me get this straight. So, you you were 20 years old on the USS Liberty in 1967, and you had already two tours of the, in Vietnam behind you. Yes. Now, I wasn't on the ground, but I was there in Vietnam. I was uh, on a ship. We were uh, uh, transporting. It was an ammo ship, USS Mauna Kea. We were there uh, transferring needed ammunition for the for the uh, soldiers, Marines, airmen over there. And uh, it, it was not good. The news coming out of there and everything, and it was it was not fun. We You talking about being called bad names. Yeah, they, we could, we could, we'd come back from uh, Vietnam and the ship would get refinished and, uh, you know, repairs and all that, and we'd go back out to sea. But uh, we were called baby killers. We, we weren't killing anybody. They had signs, sailors and dogs keep off the lawn. The same thing in Norfolk, Virginia. Sailors and dollar, dogs keep off the lawn. That's how much they thought about American servicemen. Now, they're treated like they should be treated with respect and honor uh, that the Vietnam vets brought that up upon uh, the military and uh, the Vietnam veterans especially worked hard to get these men and women that respected deserve serving our country. And for that, all Vietnam's uh, veterans should be very proud. On that note, Phil, it was my, my privilege talking to you. I can only wish that you have many more years left where you can tell this story. I sure hope so. I'm 77 now. So, uh, We'll, we'll see how it goes, but I'm not looking on dying any, anytime soon, not unless my car blows up. You have any concerns in that direction? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah, I've been, I've been, th I've been threatened. My wife and I were in uh, San Diego. Uh, we were in a restaurant. Well, it was a restaurant bar. We were at the bar waiting for a table. And this uh, man sat down next to me. He said, uh, oh, you were on the Liberty, huh? And I said, yeah. I, I couldn't figure out how he knew that. And he said, uh, you know, that was that was all a mistake and everything like that. And he had a great big watch on. He was This is like 20 years, or no, about 15 years ago. No, it's 15 to 17. He had this big watch on, and he, would, he was shoving it in my face. I said, get that thing away from me, man. What are you doing? Videotaping me or what? I didn't know what he was doing taking my voice down and he said uh my wife was there too she heard the whole conversation and uh he said uh i'm not really a doctor i work i'm a massage agent and i'm telling you you better keep your mouth shut it's for your own good we got in somewhat of an argument my wife jumped right down his throat i mean she's feisty she went right after him then they had to have security come exit to take us up to our room because this guy was threatening. The next day we found out that uh, he had been in there casing the joint two or three days before I got there with my wife. How did he know I was even there? How did he know? I, are they checking my credit cards? Or are they, what are they doing? How did they know I was there? And why would they pick me out especially to tell me that? I guess why? Because I've, I've been doing this for so long and I've been talking about it for so long. I've written books and so on and so forth. That's why they did it. Um, there's several other things, uh, tires, the wheels were, lug nuts were taken off my truck, tire fell off of it, my son in it. I think that was another warning shot across the bow. But uh, that's the kind of the things you get when you uh, fight the good fight. And, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to stay alive this long. Let's hope it continues. Are there any other incidents like this from other survivors? 
You know, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't quote any right now. I'm sure there is, but we were all told to shut up. And I, I think most of them took that literally. But on sac Sacrificing Liberty, that film, it's a four-hour docu-series. Docu uh, it's just, I can't tell you how, how, my, how good it is, but uh, I'll have to check into that. That's, a, that's a, good, a good point to check into. I'll check with my other guys and see. Mm -hmm. And from the U.S. government, were there any reprisals to anyone who, who talked or who published something? Well, uh, Jim Ennis, he wrote the first book, Assault on the Liberty, and his, all of his books that he sold or, 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 or got or gave away or whatever were taken out of the libraries. They were taken out of the libraries. I don't know by who, by our government, by, or they were ordered to by our government. That's a reprisal. They didn't want the truth to come out, but he did break the ice on that, and I'll give Jim a lot of credit for that. He was a, he was a lieutenant aboard the ship. He was an intelligence officer. And uh, he was uh, wounded pretty bad on the first pass, busted his leg off, and uh, not off, but ruined his leg. And, uh, you know, he's probably 80, 85, 84, 85 now, at least at that range. But we're all we're all getting old, uh, Thomas, and, and uh, we'll just keep on fighting. But I'll tell you, man, I really appreciate you and uh, what you're doing for – for not just the liberty, but America and the country, the world, for that matter. Uh, keep up the good work. And I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, edited will. version. <laughs> you, you will. And I, I would like to, to uh, conclude with something. And that something is an indication of your modesty. Yeah. So as I said, I did some research, right? And I found that not only did you receive the Purple Heart, right? But I also read the list of reasons why you were provided the Purple Heart, right? So you saved multiple lives that day. You went, by, by doing so, you had to go into the direct line of fire multiple times, yeah? So, and again, that you not even mention this, yeah, uh, speaks to your modesty, right? So it's not me, you know, it's, it's you. You deserve, you know, the the attention, the, the the you know the the respect for for what you did, right? Well, I appreciate that, and I might say on the award they gave me, uh, the bronze star with the V. Yeah, they they I didn't ask for that. They they gave it to me. It was bestowed on me. I, I didn't. Ask, I was happy to get out of there with my life, but uh, in that award. There was not one word of Israel on it. They said a lot of things, but they didn't say who attacked us or anything. Now, in that in itself is a cover-up. They give me this award, and it's the same thing with everybody aboard that ship that got awards. Israel was there, not mentioned one bit. There was a story, um, correct me if I'm wrong. So you or a group of liberty survivors were actually in the White House? And were not uh, received by the president. What's the story? Yes, we were at the uh, in the Rose Garden waiting for uh, George W. Bush. He, he promised to come see us and talk to us. The captain was there wearing his Medal of Honor, and uh, there's probably 30 of his survivors with their wives. And we were waiting in in D.C. in in the summer. It was very, very hot, 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 hot. Was, you know, it's humid and everything. And we waited and waited and waited, waited for him. And he drove by in his limo and waved, and that was it. Brent Scrocroft and uh, John Sununu came out and said, well, the president is really busy. He can't see you. Da, 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 da. So we got blown off again by the president of the United States, and he just spit on the captain's Medal of Honor. He spit on all of us. And that's what they've been doing for the last 56 and a half years is spitting on one of the, one of the most decorated cu uh, crews in the United States naval history for a single engagement. And they spit on us. We're tired of it. We're fighting back hard as we can. We're old, but we're still feisty. Good. 
on that note, Phil, again, my privilege talking to you. Thank you for your time. Most appreciated. And you definitely will hear from me again. Okay. Well, thanks, Thomas. Have a great day and uh, enjoy the spring. It's snowing outside here, buddy. <laughs> Same to you. All the best. Okay. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.